Let's see if this works a little better with some sand. I made a couple of very small pieces like this recently, and uh, I thought, well, when I go to Westchester, I'll just try to expand the scale a little bit, see how it works. I learned on the wheel, I had no native ability. I taught for 39 years. I never, ever had a student who took as long to learn to center clay as I did. And I don't know why I stayed with it. I don't know why it was important. If somebody had told me it was important and that I should learn it, I probably wouldn't have stayed with it. It would have brought out my orneriness, but because it seemed like, it seemed like being made a fool of by this mindless little bit of the planet. I just felt as though it was important and I wanted to do it. So I just stayed with it. And eventually I learned what we never forget once we learn how to center clay, one of life's basic things to learn. You get to different points in your career when you want to investigate things. You want to take risks. Even if it means making a fool of yourself on camera in front of people you'll never see again in your whole life. I hope not, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just to see what happens. Well, he brought these pots with him in boxes and it looked as though he knew what he was doing until he demonstrated for us. <laughs> he said he made them. Yeah, it feels uh, better with the sand in it, Andrew. Yeah. Pretty gutsy stuff. It trims beautifully, so. Clay has so many personalities. <clears throat> clay is not clay. Clay is many things. It's not a single thing. Some of it is so sensitive and just makes us try to understand the material, the touch of it, what we can do, what we can tell it to do, what it can tell us to do. It's all in the same package.
some people will only use clay that they go and dig up themselves. I mean, it's that important to them. <clears throat> They only want to use local clay. Well, look at that. I was hoping I wouldn't have to squeeze in on it, but maybe I will now and see. No, it's hopeless. We'll see what it does. Maybe it'll tear better. How new are these forms for you, Jack? Hmm? How new are these forms for you? How, how long have you been making these? Oh, this is the fifth one. <laughs> 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 I made two at home, and I think this is the third one that I've made here. Yeah, I thought I was going to enjoy making these forms, and then I went to Westchester. <laughs> <laughs> I changed my mind. I thought, well, gee, can you make nice cracks or not? I think not. Um, so what I do like is uh, the way that the bottom of the form is um, setting me up for the feet and I'm going to try this with a lot of clays. I like this twisting that's going on down here. It gives me a sense of what I'm able to cut out to uh, make uh, four feet. I'm going to do it um, from a triangular piece of clay instead of a square one. So I've got three corners. That's going to put less torque on it. The torque is going to be more concentrated to a certain place. And um, so it will have three feet, more like a metate, a grinding uh, uh, stone. So thank you for being patient and um, watching me. Yeah, I'm always, I'll just put the pin in the Be there someplace. Good. Okay. Okay. You try it with three corners and see if that makes any difference. read you another poem. I grew up in a town so small in northern Pennsylvania that there wasn't anybody who knew how to blow bubbles with bubble gum. And it took an informal workshop by a guy who visited our town to see his relatives to show us how to blow bubbles. And it was, it was antagonizing to us kids to see pictures in Life magazine of kids who knew how to blow bubbles without chewing the gum and holding it up to their lips and blowing it. That's, how, that's what we thought blowing bubbles with bubble gum was all about. 
And then all of a sudden, here in Life magazine, there are these kids, they're just standing there with no hands, and their faces are obscured by these giant bubbles. That was antagonizing to us. How do they do this? This poem is called When Bubble Gum Came to Our Town. <clears throat> After World War II, fleers, tops, and double bubble appeared at Boyle's Five and Dime. They were sweeter than sugar, too rare to stick under the soda fountain counter at Gillette's drugstore. We chewed the flavor away, rewrapping the wad for later, gum that matched our gums. Kids appeared in Life and Look magazines, their faces obscured by pink balloons. But the best we could do was unfold the blocky rectangles from their cartoon paper and chewingly rubberize them before stretching the moist diaphragms over our lips, puffing out sad blisters like the ones in old bicycle tires. But one summer, Jack Matthews came from New Jersey to visit his aunt and uncle and showed us the no hands way. Six of us made an audience of ourselves, chewing in unison at the first ward playground. He did it without thinking, but thought handicapped us until we gave up and let our laughter, tongues, and teeth learn the way. One by one, we mastered the craft. The tasty gasket flattened under the palate then thrust between teeth parted just so, our tongues pocketing and withdrawing from the breath space, a tentative exhalation, a quavering sphere we watched, cross-eyed, bloom. So what was the first craft that you learned? I think. I think this was my first exposure to craft. And it was a kind of internal and external thing that you did with your body. It wasn't like turning a somersault with your whole body. It wasn't like learning how to hold a bat to uh, hit a ball, you know. It was uh, inside and outside, and it was stupid when you think about it, but it was important <laughs> when you're a kid, <laughs> things <laughs> that you're going to end up thinking are stupid are not stupid, they're important. So I feel that way about centering. You know, it, it was a start. I had no idea it was going to be a career, for God's sake. It was something I wanted to do. And then there has never been a reason to quit. It's always been both challenging and rewarding. And you know all about that. <laughs> you don't ever want to say, of all the pieces I'm putting in the kill, I hope this one comes out. It's always a jinx, believe me. Don't ever say that. No better. kind of centered. <clears throat> Someday at the next workshop, I'm going to be saying, I learned to do this in Westchester, Pennsylvania.
when I lived here, the summer after I graduated, I worked at Emberyville State Hospital uh, for the insane, as it was called then. Um, just west of Marshallton. I think it's, it's just sitting there now. That was a real lesson in compassion. I worked in a geriatric wing midnight to eight o'clock in the morning, trying to stay awake, trying to go to sleep after work. But working with people who had been pretty much given up on by their families and put in my care and the care of other attendants who worked there. I just learned so much about people and sadness. People who were never gonna come out the front door. See, it's, it's tough on the clay when we're not compressing it, when we're throwing. It's getting this message about being compressed from just the inside. And so there's no teamwork. There's nothing compressing from the outside. So the clay is going to be very confused and maybe it's just going to crack up as much as the other ones did. But if it does, we'll know that. So we'll go ahead and do it. See, how much can I spread this out? Now, oh, there it goes. There it goes, cracking. Okay, I'll give it one more little little shot, but it looks as though, oh, I know, what if I make the wheel go the other way around? And figure out how to do that. No, not right, it's skiddy. I have to really womp it down on the clay. I'm gonna work on this when I leave here. In the meantime, I'll throw something with expertise. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, no sand, please. Okay, thank you. So this is some of Andrew's porcelain. And um, is this been mixed up pretty recently? Or? Mixed, uh, Monday, or no, Friday. Uh huh.
Ajá. Gee, it snowed last night up where we live. It did. Yeah. But it all went away. The daffodils are just coming out up there. It's about three hours west of here. And uh, I think it's about a thousand feet elevation. Very quiet. Over 90% of the population in my town voted the wrong way. But that's how it is. Let's just get a feel for it. <clears throat> Make some little balls. <laughs> you have an empty balls project, huh? We did, we did it two years ago with empty ice cream balls. Yeah. Oh. Well, this is quite good. Um, could you get me my little green rib? Thank you. No, the other one. It's farther down. It's a green. Little bull rib. I was using it inside that one. Uh, if I can make this do. Yeah, I was I was pushing that out. That's okay. This is this is working okay. I just wanted to get a feel for this clay. It's really quite nice. That'll be determined when it comes out of the kiln, though, right? <laughs> so far, yep. <laughs> And is there anything else drying back there or not? Was Maybe it just. Your white trim? Yeah. Um, no, there's no, no more work to trim. Mm hmm. Can you we should try all kinds of clay, find out what they offer us, find out what our favorite forms are to make, and just make lots and lots and lots of them. When we start out, we usually make maybe a cup and a pitcher and a plate and a bowl, and that's a hopeless way to not learn. Better to pick a form and just stick with it, especially bowls. I think bowls are really nice. One of the slides I didn't show was a hundred little bottles. I taught in Australia one time and I gave the assignment for everybody to make a hundred bottles. They were uh, small bottles, you know, from a oh, pound of clay maybe. and. Um, it is one of the most wonderful assignments to see the results of people just sitting down to work and they have a lot of balls of clay and they start making these little bottles. The first student I had who, um, who did that, 
set them all out. He kept all of them. And we had the most wonderful critique of just looking at them and just arranging them. You got the bottom, what kind of foot is it going to have? How wide is it going to be? How stretchy is it going to be in the middle? Is it going to, is it going to be flat and round? Is it going to be spherical? Is it going to come up and then have a high shoulder like a Song Dynasty piece? You know, there are all these options. So what kind of neck is it going to have? Is it going to have a long, skinny neck? Is it going to have flat, compressed neck? All these things that to anybody else, it wouldn't matter. They'd say, that's nice, just keep it like that. But when you're working, you're really exploring forms, then you're, you're examining all the options you never knew you had. And that's where our, our vocabulary develops when we take on a project like that. I just think that is, is a really fascinating thing. I would never make that as a general assignment to everybody, but to people who like to throw for its own sake, sure, make a hundred of something. One of the assignments I gave beginning classes sometimes was uh, to make a model of a house that they had lived in. It was for a beginning class and they didn't know that it's difficult to make a house, so they weren't inhibi in inhibited by it, by not knowing, and they weren't intimidated. They just made a house, and it was the greatest way to get to know students and for them to get to know each other, because a lot of them were freshmen, and they didn't know each other, they came from different parts of the country, and here they were making these houses. So we had maybe 20 people in class. We had a great big work table, and we set them all out. And on a little card, we wrote the address of the house. <laughs> and so we had uh, made a little village that couldn't have existed anywhere else in the world, and people were um, able to talk about their houses. They had to write a little essay about what it was like to live in that house. Because when you go to college, the most frequent question you're asked is, where are you from? And here is a three-dimensional representation of where people are from. And reading their essays in class gave us a better sense of who we were to each other. And I also gave that assignment with adults one time at Haystack. And that worked out well because most adults in this country have moved innumerable times. In fact, I asked this of the first class I ever gave that assignment to and out of 19 people, one person was still living in uh, his original house. One person had moved nine times. He was 19 years old and he had moved nine times. So he had a big choice of what house to make, but also a very different take on what it was like to grow up constantly shifting a frame of reference and getting to be an expert on being unknown in your school. Not an easy thing to do.
Build a house, show us which room was yours. What was it like? What did you see when you looked out? What do you miss? What do you miss about that place? Did you ever hear of a book called The Poetics of Space? Gaston Bachelard? Yeah, it's a, it's a very important book. Not a page turner, but it's a lot of great information in there. But how we relate to space, like drawers, things you open, cupboards, intimate spaces that you inhabit as a child, special places, places you make little forts, little hideouts, and how we relate to that space. It has a lot to do with how we appreciate sculpture or not. Have any of you ever been to Storm King, the sculpture park outside New York State? It, and it's right along the New York Thruway. What a great place to visit. It's a, um, a huge, several hundred acres of sculpture, great big, Alexander Calder pieces. Maya Lin has a, a big piece up there, an earthwork. Are you a fan of Andy Goldsworthy? Are you a fan of Andy Goldsworthy? Of course, yeah, Andy Goldsworthy. Did you see that piece at the east wing of the National Gallery? Uh, yeah. The domes? Yeah, I drove down there for the inauguration of that piece. He had all his uh, helpers there. These stonemasons from Scotland came over. Yeah, might be going to need the torch here, Andrew. Pretty wet for stoneware, or I mean for porcelain, but I'll see. Thank you. And have you found that little green rib? It should oh, be down for. toward the end of that. You say it's down here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is under water. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Putting on a lot of mileage during this workshop, Andrew. I need it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever think about how our brains work when we throw? Or do you think that they don't work? <laughs> they do work. <laughs> they should. And um, what happens is that the right brain controls the left side of the body. And therefore, the left hand is down inside the pot, which is always turning counterclockwise. So many things turn counterclockwise. When I was on the bus coming back from a track meet, 
with our coach. I asked if we would ever go to a school where we ran the other way on a track. Mr. Wrights, why is it that when we sit in the bleachers and watch people race, they always go from the left to the right? Mm -hmm. And is that just happen in Berks County? <laughs> or if you go into Australia, do you go the other way? And so, you don't want to know what Mr. Wright said, <laughs> but he uh, clearly had not thought about this. Did you ever go roller skating in junior high school and they reversed once a night? They would say, okay, now we're all gonna roller skate the other way. Everybody goes, oh no, not that. And you try it, you try skating clockwise and it's nuts. <laughs> and it doesn't work. And not just because you're used to going the other way. It's because it, neurologically, it's terrible to our systems. It's just wrecking everything. Skaters don't skate clockwise. They don't do their really hot shot maneuvers clockwise. They do them counterclockwise. Even dogs race counterclockwise. Really? And horses. Why is that? Being left handed and such like that? Pardon? Being left handed. Left handed. Usually it doesn't matter. I pretended there was no difference when I taught <laughs> <laughs> ceramics. Although every now and then you'd find somebody who wanted the wheel to go the other way. I'd say, fine, go the other way. Just make good pots. They do in Japan. In Japan, the wheels go clockwise. So the right hand is inside. See, the left hemisphere of the brain is the one that holds the rib. It says how far from the center of the wheel you can go. It says that to the clay. It shows what the shape is. And the inner surface is the one that we don't see, the smaller this hole gets. If it's a bowl, it's just the opposite. The right hemisphere side of the clay is what's revealed. And the left hemisphere side is underneath. I got really intrigued in reading about those things in the 70s when they there was a lot of research being done then. I wrote an article about it. It's called Jugology. When you look at the history of jug making in this country, the ones made before 1850 have an ovoid shape to them like this. After 1850, and all those pots were uh, thrown on treadle wheels or kick wheels. And then around 1850, they started motorizing the wheels with steam engines. So they would have five wheels powered by one steam engine with uh, pulleys and belts. And those wheels turned faster and they wanted to increase production and they did. But you can't throw a really delicate ovoid form on a very fast turning wheel. It takes more contemplative atmosphere, more of a uh, a, a sense of pushing out and pushing back in again. See, this is the right hemisphere of the brain up to here, pushing out. Then it takes over opposite. The left hemisphere is what pushes the clay in. Don't think about this when you're throwing. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not, <laughs> you don't have to, but
Think about it in terms of playing a guitar. The left hemisphere of the brain is a syncopator. The right hand does all the work. The right brain is the chording hand. On a piano, the right brain is playing all the bass notes and vice versa. I think a lot of these things that we take for granted really have to do with what our brains are set up to do. See, so my, my stick is a kind of internal rib. It's uh, getting rid of this clay. Whenever the clay gets compressed and drier, it gets stronger and the form is more exact. So I'll just push this in here and make a neck on it. I mean, it's a pot that everybody makes, just a bottle. I've never gotten tired of making bottles. What's the difference between a bottle and a jug? Bottle and a jug. A jug has a very specific neck. It has any number of options for a shoulder. And of course, you know, we name pots after our, our bodies. Foot, belly, shoulder, neck, lip. So a jug has a very specific neck. I've never made a porcelain jug. I've always made them of stoneware. So I like this part up here where I've left myself enough clay that I can, I can make a different determination on a kind of shoulder it's going to have. I might want to change it radically. I might want to bring it up here like this and then bring it in. So it has a more angular resolution up here. Kind of like that pot that's back here on the stand. See that? Those colors come in part from the chino glaze I used inside and also because I only bisque fire to Kono 12 and that's quite porous. So the Shino glaze has soda ash in it. <clears throat> and I usually glaze about two days before we load. You don't get that kind of flashing if you just glaze the pot and put it in the kill. The soda ash hasn't had time to work its way through the wall. Okay, I'll just flatten this out a little bit and call it quits. No, I'm just thinking intuitively. I'm um, unlike, that's another thing with a jug. With a jug, all of the tops of the jugs are the size of the potter's thumb here. 
And that's because they want them to fit the universal stopper, which is what? A corn cob. A corn cob? <laughs> yeah. Yep. 19th century America, you were never more than 100 yards from a corn cob. <laughs> like in this country, you're never more than 100 yards from a plastic bag, for better or worse. Now, I wouldn't show students how to turn pieces like this and trim the foot, because I think if you can throw a decent cylinder, you shouldn't have to turn the piece up and turn it upside down. So I would trim off this clay that's down here and give a sense of fullness to the bottle. See all that clay coming off? It was doing its work. It was holding the form together. And now the form is pretty well complete. So I just have a death grip on this tool. <laughs> and there's more. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> This is a white knuckle special. <laughs> so this clay is coming off. Maybe I want to give it a foot. So I'll just make a little notch down here and see if I can get away with making a foot. Place where the glaze would gather before it ran off on the shelf. Yeah, mm-hmm. That's, that's one of the most important things, the uh, relationship between uh, the foot and the belly, the shoulder, the neck, the lip, all of those things become intuitive. Um, there are formulas for that. The Greeks were really big on formulas, and there are people who have devised mathematical ways of measuring those, those formulas. It's called the golden mean. And uh, I, I saw that in a book and I was horrified. I mean, there are, there are people who just love math and proportions and figuring out those kinds of things and it's delightful. But it's abhorrent to me. I just, I just, I don't want to know why these proportions work. But I certainly have a good sense of when they do for my own satisfaction. And so, no, it's, it's, this is how I make everything. Just, I'm finding the form. I had no idea what I was gonna do when I centered this clay. I thought, okay, I make a little bowl, see how it feels. I make a bottle, I'll stretch the clay out, see where it goes. And, um, and now I'll just touch up the foot here a little bit. I can tell how thick that clay is down here. It's quite thick, actually. Maybe I can get away with taking a little more off. <coughs> so then would you say you have more of a consciousness when it doesn't work for you than when it does work? Yeah, I maybe so. That's a really interesting point. Negative criticism. 
as opposed to positive criticism or no criticism, <laughs> just, just making something. But there is a, a sense over time, there is a sense of rightness about things. That's, that's what I'll call it. I'll leave it to other people to do the heavy lifting on measuring the rightness. Um, I'm happy just with the uh, intuitive aspect of it. I was never good in math. I was never good in anything in school. They didn't know what to do with me. They sent me down to work in the sh wood shop, <laughs> which is kind of a potter's wheel turned on its side. So I was uh, what I call the sub-salutatorian of my high school class. I was, ne <laughs> I was next to last. And um, it, it just never ceases to astonish me that I'm, I taught at a college that I couldn't have hoped to enter into. And so when you autopsy your work, you get to see what you've done and um, uh, reasonably decent uh, thickness all the way down. A little thick down here, but for new porcelain clay, that was an adventure. I think you came up with a really good formula. You made this formula, right? Good. Yeah. I read, I read your book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, <clears throat> maybe that helped. But, now this clay, see, if you wedge this clay up and throw it, it's really plastic. When I'm throwing pitchers and I screw one up or two, uh, I always keep that clay for the handles. And um, it, it's very hard to pull very good handles with your uh, fresh clay. Uh, they just, they just, just don't stretch out as nicely. Okay, um, what time is it? It's 2.40. 2.40. Okay, I'll... I've got some stiffer stoneware here. Oh, okay. i got the stuff you waged up yesterday, too. Do you want me to make anything? You wanna, how about if I make a picture? Oh, yeah. Can I make a picture? I like... I enjoy pictures. Pardon? Do you ever handle with slabs? Oh, yes. Rarely I do work with slabs. Um, if you have a rolling pin, you don't have to just a large one. Do you have a large rolling pin? Yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's some little forms I like making with, uh, by hand. And they originated from looking for fossils. There are little fossils that um, you can find around where I live, little brachiopods. And um, I've always admired those. And I think that's what started the, the series of them. I haven't made them for a long time, but I, I should do that more. No. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Okay, this is 
what i'm going to tell you is just one of the things that you learn as a potter it has nothing to do with this workshop except i'm going to tell you the story and it just shows how important it is to be attentive to notice things so we're firing this kill in japan and a typhoon blows in and the people from the village come up the mountain and they help this young man fire his kill there's torrents of rain pouring in we are at a critical point in the firing we've reached the maximum heat we want to go to but we have to hold it there and the weather is saying i'm going to get the better of you so the people from the village come up and they help split the wood and you have to split the wood down so it's really fine and burns quickly and i'm standing there splitting wood next to this guy i think he was a barber and i noticed that sometimes he picks up his stick of wood and he either hits it or he turns it over and hits it and it always splits and sometimes i come down with the axe and it doesn't split i have to really work at it and so finally i asked the host you know please translate how come he knows what end of the stick of wood to hit and he said always hit from root end <laughs> so you have these sticks of wood and i say okay <laughs> How do you know which is the root end? And the answer was, just looking. Just looking. OK. <laughs> that was the answer. <laughs> so I never did figure out, but I, I told that to my people. And we, we look and we tell. Sometimes the wood is tapered, you know, so you figure the bigger end is the root end. But there's something to that. Now, who in the world figured that out? And why does it work? And that's uh, one of those amazing things. Normally, if I was going to make a pitcher with this much clay, I'd use two balls of clay. But we'll just see how this goes. It's really quite nice B-mix. I use B-mix wood um, fairly often for uh, the wood kill. Kevin Crow doesn't like B-mix by itself. He says it's too pretty. He combines it with a uh, a clay from um, Laguna. Sold 860. So if you have been making things for years and years, did your momentum increase at a certain time? Was there a certain time when you realized you were going to make a commitment to working with clay? Or was it organic? Did it just sneak up on you and you just continued to work? I mean, we have all these things we think about when we're working. 
or maybe you just go into a trance <laughs> and don't think. I can't help thinking about stuff, remembering things. Daydreaming. When I go to the bank, I drive up and I see the teller doing her work in there and I think, is she thinking about her grandmother's house? No, she's not. She's thinking about numbers. I think, oh, God bless her. She's doing her work. I used to work at Pepperidge Farm Frozen Foods when I was in college. They put, they put me through college. I bought a car. I went over there and I worked on weekends and I told my parents they didn't have to pay anymore for my college. I paid my way through in the frozen pastry department. And I got to work with a lot of people who worked on, on the line, pastry line. And a lot of them were pretty imaginative people. And so the work was repetitious, but their thinking was not. I came to really admire the people I worked with and learned, learned about people. Boy, this handle's like porcelain. Very smooth. It's going to be a pitcher. It better be pretty tall. So when you're choking the clay like this, you're putting torque in it. And so it's good to go back and compress it at the top and even things out and sometimes throw down just to even that torque out. It just gives you more options when you're creating a final form, especially with smooth clay. Clay with fire clay in it is it's more forgiving. It's kind of like the difference between a croissant and whole grain bread. <laughs> the porcelain is a lot like a croissant. And so is this clay. The metaphor also works because uh, porcelain has more flux in it, the way there's more butter in a croissant than so it's When I was learning, we were taught never to use ribs. Pots in the 1960s had pronounced throwing rings to show that they were by God made by hand. <laughs> and um, so then you learn the good sense of learning rib using ribs, and. Um, it compresses the clay, compressed clay is strong. Uh, 
something. Under there. Yeah, there I can't uh, yeah, my quite I reach it. <sighs> Hope it's the one I'm it's thinking there. it is. Yep, thanks. No, nope, it's right. not the one I was looking it's for. right here. Are you looking <laughs> at this one? Yep, goody. Thank you. So, do you ever talk to other people about your work, about their work? <laughs> we used to have a little group of artists who got together irregularly, usually every couple of months. And it was, it was Quaker based. So there was a query that we examined and we met at each other's homes and the host um, made up a query that we were going to think about and we didn't know what it was gonna be until we got there. So we sat quietly for, I don't know, 20 minutes, something like that. And then anybody who had anything to say about the query uh, could say it in an informal way. And there was no pressure. If you didn't have anything to say, you didn't say anything. And there was never a Q&A at the time. You said your piece and then there was, everybody got quiet and then somebody else spoke but it wasn't in direct address to the last person who had spoken. And one of the questions was, what does your mother think about your art? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. What does she think about it? Often it's the, the female who has a response. I did the the State College Arts Festival for 23 years. And I very seldom sold pots to men. And very often, if a couple came to my booth, it was because the wife was interested in getting a present for somebody, or they wanted to see what I made and they wanted to buy something. And if the wife or the female partner uh, asked the male who was with her what he thought about something, he usually said something like, whatever. <laughs> and, and she was saying, well, you know, Sally would probably like this because of the way her kitchen is designed or because of other things that she noticed Sally had in her house. And the guy would say, like, where are we going for supper? And so there would be this conversation that wasn't really a conversation. And he just basically didn't take an interest in what was going on. And I always wondered why it broke down that way. How come more men weren't interested in, um, in the pieces and looking at things carefully? Often uh, groups of gay guys were much more interested as a group from person to person in looking at the work and talking about it. But very seldom that just men generally didn't seem to care about that. And I still wonder, why is it that way? Why, why is it? Guys 
guys are many guys are not comfortable talking about feelings and and in high school i was really interested in the girls who were interested in talking about feelings as i felt the guys i hung out with because i was on sports teams you know they want to talk about sports i was okay i talked about sports but <laughs> there's another aspect of being alive that uh, most guys that i knew didn't care about and that was thinking thinking about things especially feelings so it was a relief to come across poetry and find out that feelings and uh, things like that are a big part of poetry where it comes from what are our private feelings how do we really feel about things Now, this is another thing about intuition. You do think because this is going to hold liquid, you're thinking about the center of gravity. Where is that going to be? The taller this wide part gets, the more awkward it's going to be. As long as the center of gravity is down here someplace, it's going to want to pour when you tip it. And that's going to have a lot to do with the handle, the leverage involved. I think that the models for the pictures that I, I like came from the, the paintings of Peter Bruegel. He must have loved pottery, especially pictures. Sometimes there, there's a picture, a beautiful picture, just hanging out of a second story window on a string. I mean, you have to love pictures to <laughs> put one in that position in a painting. And there he was. Sometimes the pictures were nicer than the ones that the potters were making. Maybe you know the paintings. In, in my longer slide talk, I have pictures of um, pots in a, in a Bruegel painting. Um, I think it's called the Wedding Feast. And these people are at a feast and they're all using handmade pots. And you can tell that they're wood fired, there are little spots in them, little specks, um, flashing. He just lavished attention on pots. It's such a relief to find somebody who cared enough about what he was looking at. And he was that way with everything, birds in the air. He did a painting called Parable of the Blind. And I read in a medical magazine one time that an ophthalmologist, so the parable of the blind is, I think, nine men in a line, and they're leading uh, blind, the blind leading the blind. And in this medical journal, the writer claimed that an ophthalmologist could study the faces of the people in Bruegel's painting and tell what kind of blindness they were suffering from. So, isn't that something? Yes. 
I know you're all thinking, no wonder this guy's pictures cost so much. It takes him half an hour, <laughs> half, half of an afternoon to tell himself stories while he's working. <laughs> No, no, it's another hat. It's, it's really a different hat. I think maybe, maybe what I'm doing is informing some of the poems, try to find a way to put it in a context, certain things, like that one poem about Syracuse, once in Syracuse. The last line of that poem is a result of what, what a whole series of cups is saying to the potter. And they are saying that they, they are reminding the potter that everything used to be something else. And I think I'm going to use that as the title for the next book of poems. Everything used to be something else. You can't debate that. <laughs> OK, so I don't want the rim to get too thin, skimpy. This is a serious size pitcher. It's, uh, <laughs> It's not going to have a feeble uh, little rim that is going to chip easily. I'm going to thicken it up. <laughs> it's supposed to have an identity. It's supposed to say, I am the rim. It's not just where I stop throwing, you know? It, uh, and that's going to have a lot to do with the kind of lip that it has, the pouring spout. It has to be big enough to get your hand down inside. And then this negative space in here, from here to here, that's going to have something to do with where the handle goes. And am I going to make a continuous curve come up to the lip, or am I going to break it? And I'm going to break it right here. It's going to have this little part, which gives me plenty of attachment space for a handle. Below the rim. Boy, only serious addicts can stay awake during something like this. I really hand it to all of you. <laughs> I mean, we know what it's like, right? I mean, we're making something, we're thinking about it, thinking about why we're doing it, thinking about what other people might want to know about what goes into somebody's work, because otherwise you just see a picture. It has no voice. It just sits there. And what did the person think about who was making it? That's why you go to these things. I, I, about five years ago, I decided I had taught over 200 workshops, and I hadn't taken any of them. So every year, I take a workshop, at least one workshop. And um, sometimes it's in poetry, sometimes it's in pottery. But I really like being out there where you are and watching somebody work and listening to them talk about why they're making what they're doing. It humanizes the work. What was the last workshop you took? Um, I took a workshop with uh, Elena Renker. 
Elena is a uh, New Zealand potter. She makes absolutely beautiful tea bowls. R-E-N-K-E-R. -E she has a couple of websites. She sells her work very reasonably. She works uh, with a method called Kuranuki. She starts with a solid ball of clay and she carves out. She makes beautiful tea bowls, really beautiful tea bowls. And uh, they have some often a crawling chino glaze on them. Uh, very light, very inexpensive. She's just and, and a great person. And she came and fired with us, and then she did a workshop for uh, Allison Palmer up in Connecticut. And it looked as though I was going to do a series of workshops in New Zealand, which I w would have really enjoyed returning to. But I didn't come through with the money. So <laughs> see how that curve kind of flattens out in here? I want to deal with that. I want to be a little more generous with it. Yeah, I do. Uh, I'll show you. It's usually, I, I like to think that it's uh, in proportion to the picture. I don't want to have a little narrow spout for up here. I want it to be generous. I know it's going to be about that wide. And. Um, And I like to pull the clay up first. This is, this is fairly thick here, probably thicker than many people would make it. But it's terrible to get to this point and you have a Kleenex thin rim. You can't do anything with it. It's like, oh, now what? So now I can uh, pull this up. I want it to be generous and strong. I, I'm imagining the fluid pouring out of this spout. I'm stroking it back and forth. I'm not making it razor thin. Razor thin is great for pouring because it breaks the fluid off, but also it makes it uh, vulnerable to chipping. Mm -hmm. So I try to give it some heft. And um, so, and I come across here enough so it bends out a little bit. And for some reason, it's always on this side, it's mm -hmm. not even. Usually, <clears throat> I would put the handles on after supper or later that night. Now, the one thing about B-Mix wood fire clay is that it just is really persnickety about handles. One time, I looked in the Biskill, and there were five handles on pitchers this size that were lying on a shelf. Ugh. I looked at them and, yeah, I said, oh dear. <laughs> so when I put handles on that clay, I really push hard into it back here. And I don't, I don't scratch and, uh, scratch and sniff. I do a, <laughs> uh, just a push. <laughs> so there it is. And uh, they stay on. And I'm very careful. I put them on the wood stove. I have a big slab of uh, stone on, on the wood stove. And I put them on there and make sure they're extremely dry. As a matter of fact, I hang a 100 watt light bulb down inside overnight, mm -hmm. right where the handle's attached. 
because this is very fine clay. It's almost like porcelain. It has no texture, no grog. <coughs> and I want to make sure those handles stay on. And I haven't lost any since then. I was just sloppy, I guess. As one of my students said when I asked her one time why she had consistent problems, it was Lisa Naples. Do you know Lisa? I was teaching at the University of the Arts one time and, uh, for Bill Daly. And um, Lisa was doing something f funny with a glaze, pretty consistently not working out. I said, why do you think that's happening, Lisa? And she said, I think I was in a temporary state of ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so maybe that's uh, I'll cut off a little bit down here. I think when you trim into the foot and you get rid of that clay, that it is enhancing the curvature of the piece. It did its work holding the piece up. Should we do an autopsy on this one? <laughs> Wait till I get the handle on. <laughs> Are you putting the handle on it now? Do you no, I'll wait a while. Okay. I mean, if you want to take a little break, we'll breathe Yeah. Quarter after three. Oh, okay. Yep, let's take a break. <laughs> 